It is an absolute joy if you're watching this with me because we're going to be considering the Word of God and the Word of God always uplifts us, encourages us, and it takes away our valley and puts us back on the mountaintop because we know who we are trusting. So lovely to have you with us. I'm going to be speaking on a mixed variety of things. There's a number of scriptures that I'm looking at, and all of them are absolutely beautiful. But one of the things that I want to deal and try and convey is that God is a realistic God. And that's something where he knows our thoughts. He knows how many hairs we've got on our head as such. He knows everything about us. And yet when people are inclined to go to the Lord in prayer, they almost go to him as if, well, he doesn't know about this and he doesn't know about that. And I'll be so respectful. No, be who you are, because that's who he made you. It's his glory of who you are, not yours. But there's some beautiful things I want to speak on. And it's linked to the realism and the realistic God we serve. And just as an intro, one of the things that is so precious, Jesus Christ is going to get arrested. And in short, he says, I willingly lay my life down. And yet he goes to the cross. And the cross was not a lot of fun, no matter which way you want to look at it. Because he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm not going into the detail of that. But what I'm saying is anybody who says he willingly laid his life down, it was an easy job and a walk in the park, as they say, no, no. And we face the same human life that he entered in order to save us. Yes, that's why I did it, to save our souls for eternity. And that's what these passages deal with. So I'm going to start with Titus chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 3. Titus chapter 3 from verse 3. And how amazing are these words. Um, beautiful, beautiful. And listen to them, think them through, read them again and again. But the whole book of Titus is less than the main story on the front page of a newspaper. So read Titus through, get the context, get the understanding. And again, it's a book that begins with the word Paul. And of course, the name Paul identifies the scriptures of the message of grace distinct from every other writing up until then because it has no signs of works that show to the rest of the world that we are Christians. We do have good works, but I'm going to explain that. So let me read, and uh, I'm going to read it through first, and then I'll come back and just reference a few things. So Paul writes to Titus, and he says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. Now sometimes means in the past, we were very foolish until we understood salvation through Jesus Christ. And we got an identity out of 8 billion people that made us unique. It made us a one-off, not 8 billion off. Yes, there are 8 billion humans, but we are a unique creation. And before we glory in, oh, I'm so special and unique. No, God created us. Give him the glory for who we are, not ourselves. But we thank the Lord that we are who we are. And we celebrate his grace, his mercy, his love, his peace when we get to know. And I just want to say that the, the, the correct understanding of scripture is that the message of Paul, and I'll just summarize it for you, is it's a unique message. It's a new message. And most of all, it is a distinguished message from law, which existed way back when, from when Moses gave it. But Paul, in the readings I'm going to take, distinguishes it from the grace that you and I live in, and all grace means is that we trust Christ for doing every work. And in a conversation yesterday, I was able to once again share, people go and say, please forgive me, Lord, please forgive me. Every single sin we committed was futuristic when Christ died on the cross. So when he forgave us, because he died for our sins, do you know there's nothing you can do tomorrow that was not forgiven 2,000 years ago? But that forgiveness, as Paul writes and beautifully, beautifully says, we are in the liberty of grace, but let not your liberty be a license to do whatever you want. And if you can do that, you've never actually understood what you've been saved from. And saved to heaven is the secondary part of that. The primary part is that you were saved because God didn't want our unique personality created to spend an eternity in the presence of Satan, his fallen angels, in the torment of hell. So because he loves us, he wants us there. And if you can believe that, then let me tell you, how would we ever go back to sin, which is Satan's domain, if I can put it that way. So righteousness by Christ and the Holy Ghost in us is what we now live for. So I'm going to start that again. And I did say I'd read it through it, but it says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, keyword, 
serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. It goes on and says, but, and that's always a three-letter spin, but. So that's what it was. We're going to what it is. And that is, but after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. And what was that? Ah, listen to what Paul writes. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs, and these are big words, we should be made heirs, according to the hope of eternal life. And I have to throw this in. Hope to the message of our grace, we understand. Hope is not, well, maybe, maybe not, we'll have eternal life. It's not hope like you want the rugby team to win. It's hope in that we have not seen it, but we do not for one second doubt its existence because the facts of our research, our investigation, our questions of, is God real? Is it? That's what brings us to what is hope. And that is something in the future that we have not seen yet, but we do not doubt it for one second. So hope in the English language is a somewhat different word to what is meant in this. And then it goes on and it says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. And I'll come back to those because I'm going to run through. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Now, isn't that interesting? You maintain consistently your good works, but it's not your good works that saved you. It was God's mercy. So is that a contradiction? No, we'll get to that, because I'm just going to reflect through it, and I'm going to go to a few other verses. So let's just start there again, having read it, and now getting to the detail. It says, for we ourselves, which were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Now you compare that to the Ten Commandments and see how many things are broken in that simple statement of what we were and certainly should not be currently in the salvation in Christ. Are you with me? It's amazing. If you read that, you'll see quite a few things, deception, deceit, which is what it comes from, but living in malice and envy, thou shalt not covet. Ah, that's one of the Ten Commandments. But when we previously lived, we lived that the law would have been to the Jewish nation how you should be living. And yet when we were not saved, we lived in the very things that were not the way God designed us to live. But it goes on and it says, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. And again, I can't but just have my brain bombed by these words because what does it say it says but after that the kindness and love of god our savior now kindness and love of god we were we were crazy critters if i can put it that way but you know what it says we then discovered because the love of god and the kindness of god our saviour toward man appeared. So when we were prepared to hear, we understood something about the grace, but it is the love of God. And he goes on and says, of God, our saviour. We've been saved from something. If we forget what we are saved from, I promise you, in my estimation, you will never rejoice, no matter what circumstances may toss you upside down. You will never rejoice unless you see what we are saved from, and it makes our problems look like nothing at all compared to the problem we once had, which was eternal existence without the presence of God, which we now have been promised. And then it goes on and it says, not only the love of God through our Savior and of God our Savior, it says, and this is so, so good. Oh my goodness me, I, I hope I can get it together. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done now isn't that interesting so being a good person rubbish why 
because we are incapable of righteousness without the righteousness of Christ within us. So when we try to be good people to please God, what the height of insult that is to the sufficiency of the sacrifice of God's Son, who was also the creator of heaven and earth. So to think that we can offer good works, my goodness me, what? who do we think we are? And boy, oh boy, that's not an, a, a statement of downing anyone. It's just a statement of if the absolute security of eternity rested on us, we would spend our life panicking, fearing, distressing. But it depends on the work of Christ because it's his righteousness. So it's not by our works of righteousness, but as he says, the works that we have done, but, and there's that three letters spin around word, but according to his mercy. And I can't skip that because mercy is God's attitude of loving us, knowing we were born sinners from Adam and Eve who created a bloodline that we are born sinners. And that I'm saying we sin because we are sinners. We are not sinners because we sin. Make sense? Think it through. And then it goes on and it says his mercy. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, just as a reference point, where Paul writes, again, Paul, he's speaking to the Corinthians, and he speaks about the newness in Christ. And listen to these words, how beautiful they are. We did not do this. God did it in us. And a wonderful verse to memorize, to remind us of how incredible it is that we cannot change ourselves, but God makes us a new creation. Let's go there. Second Corinthians, and of course we're going to chapter 5, and we are reading verse 17. And if you read around that verse, oh, beautiful. There's much. If you want to go there and spend some time just reading the scriptures on this particular aspect, it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, and how are we in Christ? By trusting him that he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Holy Ghost comes into our life, seals us, and the Bible uses a term, we are in Christ. So I uh, need to just make sure that that's the concept you're with. And it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God. Who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So when we come to know the Lord, we've been given a ministry. You may say, but I'm not in the full-time ministry. Please never make that mistake. When we know the truth of the scriptures, it ignites uh, an incredible excitement, newness of life that is referred to there. And you'll know what I'm talking about if you've trusted Christ. Everything is just so different because now there's a reason for breathing. And what it says is that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And that means to share with others exactly this, to grow in our understanding. And can I say, and I'm going to throw this in, and that is we need to grow, we need to learn, we need to understand. And it was God, not man, who designed church fellowship. Now, that's not the church constitution. The church is an organization. The word church means people gathered together, called out people. They weren't called out because they didn't want to go. But in Christ, when you are put in Christ, you are part of a new, first of all, you're a new creation. But second of all, you're part of a new fellowship of people who celebrate grace together in their conversations, in hearing the teaching of God's word. And that's why as a ministry, we have a very different ministry. You can't become a member of our church because if you're a member of the body of Christ. What do you want to be a member of a local church for? And I'm not saying that there's not a civil need for that, but a spiritual need? No, worldwide, we are part of one body if you're a believer in Christ correctly, and that is the body of Christ, because you are a new creation in Christ, and so is ever, every other believer who believes correctly. So just touching on this to conclude that, and that is that church fellowship is something that probably, and again, please understand where I'm coming from and consider this and think it through. If you wanted to undo the message of the grace of God without works, who preaches that? All the different faiths of the world? 
No, only Christianity. So if there was a target, as they say, the crosshairs of the telescope or on a rifle, where would you aim if you were Satan? To make people attend churches if they wanted to, but never understand the fullness of grace. So it is a strategy to say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. No, that's not what Paul writes and says, and he's not mincing his words here. Why? Because he says that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Of what? Of man to God through whoever shared the gospel with us, we are going to share with others because we can't remain silent. It's too exciting. We worry about people who haven't believed in Christ. That is a natural byproduct of the grace of God in our hearts. We want others to find this glorious, glorious identity, newness of life that I just spoke of that is in Christ. So having said that, that's where Paul writes, and going back to Titus chapter 3, um, that's where he writes and says the, in verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Then he goes on and he says, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And then listen to what he goes on to. How beautiful is this? That being justified, by his grace. Now, if you want to read about that, read Romans chapter 3, read Romans 5, 1. Um, they will give you more background on that, where it says here that being justified by his grace, and I'm going to put it into a very practical understanding. If you go to court and you're being sued for something, but you can say, I did it because of this, then they say, well, you are justified in what you did. In other words, you are innocent. So God says we are justified by his grace grace. What does that mean? God says, yes, you were a sinner, but I'm not going to hold it against you because Christ paid the price for you of your sin on the cross. When my justice, instead of pouring it out on you, I poured it out on my son, Jesus Christ, so that I could deal with it, but I'll wipe the slate clean. And when you enter heaven, I will never see the sin of your life because Christ paid in full for it. Now, I hope that the concept of that, the truth of that in what I've shared is your heartfelt knowledge of what the scriptures teach. And what I want to say to you, please do not mince these words because they are taken from the scripture. And that is, if you are praying for forgiveness for the things you did yesterday and what you might do tomorrow, uh -uh, then you don't believe we were justified in Christ when he died for us 2,000 years ago. And what does that mean? It means we are continually looking at our works to plead with God to forgive us so that we can go to heaven. No, heaven was the first gift and righteousness is the first gift normally. Heaven, the assurance of heaven is because we're not depending on ourselves, not by our works of righteousness, says the scripture that we are read it. So what I'm saying is that the grace of God in the cross of Calvary, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ means the day we trust that and we don't look at what we do, but what Christ did. Because remember, it's human nature by default. We say, well, you know what? I've done this wrong and I want God to forgive me. No, he's forgiving you. That's why guilt is the trigger of grace. If we could not do anything wrong, or we thought we weren't that bad, how would we know we need a savior? Ah, so our past, we realize God forgave everything. Our future, God has forgiven everything. Now, when he says that being justified, as I said, by his grace, we will never face our sin in God's justice and punishment. Having said that, glorious beyond words. It's been wonderful to share with, our, with you what I have. I'm going to continue on this, and I'm going to ask you to go and read Romans 3, read Romans 5, 1, read about being justified, because that is so critical. Otherwise, you're going to keep coming back to, I failed God and I did this, and your works never mix your works with salvation. Salvation is Christ's part. Good works we'll look at next time. And good works is once you are saved, once you are sealed, once you have been given the glory of being an heir, which is part of that verse, you then are guaranteed heaven is your home and you never have to worry about it. Your good works, you do have to worry about, but not to be justified and not your works of righteousness, but the gift of God's grace, mercy, love in our Savior 
and Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you'll join us next time because no matter how many times I share this glorious gospel, it just reignites within you. What a wonderful thing. We are not at the mercy of circumstances, situations, finances, politics, whatever. We live within them. We struggle within them sometimes. But we know we've got a bigger picture that takes us through. Glory be to God. Thank you.